Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Carmen McGinnis. For those of you new to this channel, I'm a board certified behavior analyst and psychologist. I'm trained in acceptance and commitment therapy and attachment theory. In my practice, I focus on relationships between men and women, young and adult children and their parents, and the relationship we each have with ourselves, the primary relationship. On Sundays, I broadcast a segment on topics related to these. So today, my topic is the social, emotional, and neurological effects of early trauma. This might include overt or covert abuse of some sort, or neglect, which is considered abuse, or separation from the parent or parents due to an illness, death, divorce, war, or legal action of some sort, such as imprisonment or internment of any sort apart from the parent. So my ideal audience today would be anyone who was exposed to such events, either as a child or as a parent, or someone who was, who was or is in care of children like this, such as a relative or a foster parent, and of course anyone who has a societal interest in problems such as these. As adults, we tend to think of events such as these intellectually. We think our way through them and rationalize them and understand either why they are happening or that sometimes bad things just happen to good people. And we assume that children are doing something like that only, of course, with a less mature, less informed intellect. Nothing could be further from the truth. For children, traumatic events are processed at a cellular level. The amygdala are engaged so that every sight, sound, and other sensation is magnified, slowed to a crawl, and recorded in either conscious memory, if the child doesn't dissociate, or the subconscious, if he does, if he or she does. This is similar to what happens to an adult in a traumatic scenario, only, as mentioned, the adult engages the intellect to his ability. And certainly that ability is limited during tra trauma when access to the cortex is impaired by all this midbrain activity that's going on in the amygdala. But there is intellect at play for adults at some level. And unless the adult dissociates during the traumatic event, which may well lead to post-traumatic symptoms, he will likely recover with few lasting effects once the trauma is over. Not so for children, and my experience in presenting this talk, or talks like it, live, is that most adults actually believe children will recover more easily because they're young, resilient, and may not even remember the event. These are things that I've heard during live presentations of talks like this that I've given. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. It is their very youth that makes children more, not less, vulnerable to the lasting effects of trauma. Though they may be more physically resilient, softer bones and stronger immune systems than us old folk, children have not yet developed psychological resilience. Psychological resilience comes from experiences in which we recovered because of our own resources and the support of friends and family. Children have not yet had those experiences. And it's the very fact that children record traumatic events in the subconscious that makes these memories so dangerous. As my title implies, the lasting effects of trauma are social, emotional, and neurological. Let's examine each one in turn. Social effects. Children who've experienced early trauma learn that the world is a bad place and that they are unsafe within it. That's the lesson that they get. 
there is a profound sense of vulnerability and fear that follows early trauma. Not just a single fear or a, or a moment um, that passes. For children of trauma, vulnerability is not a passing state, but rather a trait. It becomes part of who they are. They find it difficult, if not impossible, to feel safe. They're unable to trust others to look out for them because it didn't work out in the past. They lack confidence in themselves, and because they're not confident in anyone else, they never learn to be confident in themselves. And they may either externalize or internalize these feelings, or both. In other words, they may act out, become aggressive, non-compliant, or they may become anxious, depressed, and self-blaming, or all of the above. The emotional effects. As we can well imagine, with all of the above that I just mentioned going on, it's nearly impossible to form loving relationships with others. And these effects carry on into adult re relationships. Though they may bond and even marry, the bonds lack real trust. There's, there's boundaries that never get let down. And love is about being willing to be vulnerable with another person. And it's difficult to feel protective of someone else when you don't feel safe yourself. And let us not forget that the root causes the the, of the traumatic event itself is largely subconscious. They don't necessarily remember exactly what happened. Even when the adult knows that some bad thing happened in their childhood, mom died, or dad left us when I was four, or there was a war and we had to escape, the knowledge of such events remains stunted at the developmental age of the child at the time that the trauma occurred. The emotional effects continued. Adults who suffered trauma as children are at greater risk of cluster B personality disorders, or at least many of the traits and symptoms listed in the DSM cluster B section such as narcissism or its flip side, codependency. They have a higher incidence of divorce and their children may also suffer. They're more likely to. They're more anxious and or depressed, often both. They're less likely to comply with social mores and may engage in risky sex, become promiscuous, or drug or alcohol users. And they're at greater risk of unemployment and imprisonment. The neurological effects of trauma. When trauma occurs during critical developmental stages, the brain may be affected. The amygdala may initially become inflamed and then later shrivel. The hippocampus, which is part of the same system and records memories, may also be affected, making it difficult to learn to form richly clear new memories. When this occurs, learning will also be affected, as will hormonal production. And those affected may have higher levels of circulating cortisol, leaving them prone to stress and overweight, and even disease. Over or under sensitivity to memory sorry, to sensory stimuli may also occur, making these individuals appear jumpy or numb to the world. The individual may find it very difficult to calm himself to do what we call self-regulation. And lastly, the victims of early trauma may suffer from physical symptoms, such as headaches, skin conditions, gastrointestinal difficulties, trouble falling or staying asleep, and bodily aches and pains. So we see that early trauma of any sort has lasting effects, well past the actual dangers of the actual trauma. As with most of life's challenges, repair is possible. 
Narrative therapy is very effective at any age. Forming bonds with safe, well-adjusted caregivers and lovers is also another way forward. It can be a very effective step toward recovery. And sometimes forming a bond with a therapist is the only thing that really can happen, or, or perhaps the first thing that should happen. A strong bond with a therapist or life coach trained in childhood trauma may be necessary for some victims as a starting point. So that's all I have to say for today. There are many other resources on the internet for those affected by early trauma. If, you're, if you are one or supporting one in some way, or as I said, someone who's interested in the societal effects of trauma that we see happening in our world today. I urge you to seek out information and help. Please don't push anything any deeper than it already is. A little digging may be painful, but can go a very long way toward recovery. I wish you all a very happy and peaceful Sunday and much love. Thank you for viewing and please like and subscribe if you found this helpful or simply informative. Thank you for stopping by.